Hello everyone, I'm Simon. I'm a PhD student from the Quantitative Biology Center in Tübingen. And I'm going to present you cluster scalable punching graph construction with NF core punch genome. Hmm. Okay. So Eric Garrison yesterday already told you something about punch genomes. This will be just a quick repetition to quickly get you up to date. So what we usually have is a batch of individuals and then we compare these against one single reference genome and then we can observe certain kinds of variation like insertions, deletions or other single regular changes. However, what we miss is the variation between all of these individuals and so we are driven by a reference bias. And one solution here is that we can actually take all of these individuals, align them versus each other and then present them in a graphical model. So that this graphic model then contains actually all the variation as before and all the sequences that these individuals share are then compressed in uh, several uh, nodes. <clears throat> now when you want to explore the punch genome, we also need cool visualizations and I'm happy to tell you that one way to visualize the uh, chuan genome actually is also in a tube map like we do in NF core. So you're already familiar with this. Now, how can we build such punch genome graphs? What you see here basically is the workflow of the punch genome graph builder that Eric showed you yesterday. So first we have an all versus all alignment step, WF mesh, then Sequish actually takes these alignments and introduces these into a variation graph. And then we smooth the graph and uh, remove some redundant nodes and basically this is the core workflow. And on top of this, what we can also do is we can call variants to any kind of individual in such graph. And also what we do as a, like to get an idea of the quality of the build punch genome graph is that we can actually translate this graph into the so-called OCHI format. And OCHI is also a tool, a, a variation type graph tool. And then we can generate the statistics of this graph or we can um, actually produce certain 1D visualizations and 2D visualizations, which you already saw yesterday. <clears throat> and all of these things are then collected in one multi-QC report. Yeah, and this is basically what's happening in this punching graph builder pipeline. However, it is written in bash. And so I took the opportunity to actually put this into NF core using Nextflow. And that's now the core workflow of the NF core punch genome graph pipeline. Yeah. Of course, now on a, when I port this to Nextflow, we want to, to scale better because now we can make use of nodes of the cluster. And so what we can do here is that we can uh, apply WF mesh and just do the all versus all approximate mappings. Then we can take these mappings and split them into chunks. Let's say, for example, 100. And then for each of these 100 chunks, we can execute the base per level alignment, for example, on 100 nodes in parallel. And so this helps us to save a huge amount of time. <clears throat> what is also possible is that um, um, thinking about human, for example, we have several chromosomes. And usually the idea is when we did the mappings, then um, we want to detect uh, the communities like Eric did yesterday with the acrocentrics. And so the idea is that we later we will have roughly one graph, com one graphical component for each of the communities. So one chromosome corresponds to one graph uh, component. And this is uh, what's happening here. So we can detect the communities. And then for each community, again, this core uh, pipeline steps are executed uh, in parallel on nodes on the cluster. <clears throat> Once we have all the communities, we can combine them again into one final graph, and then we can do again the statistics and visualization steps again. <clears throat> so here I have uh, one example of when I build a punch genome graph of uh, Dodoromyces elongus spores. It's a yeast fungi, and also it's an underestimated pathogen. So um, Old people that have a weak immune system actually can die within days if they got infected with this uh, these fungi. So it can be pretty severe. And that's why it's interesting to study. It has roughly the same gene length as yeast, and it comes with eight chromosomes and some mtDNA. And doing a, a 
punching a workshop this year. Um, several colleagues actually came up with 11 assemblies from Nanopro and Illumina data. And two of them were fully assembled and the other ones were not fully assembled, so they still consist of contigs. And some of these contigs are actually really small, like only thousands of base pairs. And as we will see later, this can be then quite a challenge to build the punch genome graph from. <clears throat> so first I executed the workflow as seen before in this community mode. Now the cool thing is that actually we get these nine communities, what we were kind of expecting, right? So we have eight chromosomes plus the MT DNA. And what you can see here are actually 2D visualizations of the punch genome graph. So most of these chromosomes are actually linear. There's not so much large structural variation going on. However, these thin tails that you can see here or here, for example, this, this is unmapped sequence. So that's uh, unique to maybe one or two uh, strains in this graph. So that's, that's not really good. And also chromosome H and chromosome B look uh, kind of messy. So what we did then is that we took another approach to this community detection. <clears throat> and what we did there is that we took one uh, reference strain and then we mapped all the contigs to this reference strain because from the reference strain we already know into which, like, which sequence corresponds to which chromosome. And that's what we did here. And now for each of these communities, again, we run the NF core punch genome pipeline and obtained these graphs that you see here. Now we have much more linear chromosomes. Even chromosome B looks beautiful now but chromosome H is still a mess. And so we went back to the people who generated the assemblies and we actually took a closer look at the two fully assembled uh, strains. And so what we then came up with is that we actually need to put the sequences and contigs of uh, basically of these communities that we had before of chromosome C, chromosome H and chromosome G into one graphical component and then now we see this beautiful uh, punch genome graph. So we have very linear chromosome A and chromosome B. Then we have this large graphical component of chromosome C, H, and G. And then we have the other chromosomes, chromosome D, E, F, and the mitochondrial DNA. And this chromosome community detection algorithm in the beginning here maybe didn't work as well as we expected because the contigs are of such a large, like different size from several million base pairs to just 1,000 base pairs. And so the cluster algorithm might have had difficulties there. Now, how does the pipeline scale? Next, I build a punch genome graph of 1,000 chromosome 19 genomes. And uh, chromosome 19 has a length of around 59 mega base pairs. And here you can see some timings. So WF mesh map took nine hours. Then I split these, the output into 100 chunks, and then each of these chunks actually took two hours. The sequence step took uh, one day and 13 hours, and smoothly she finished within 15 hours. So that was actually surprisingly doable. What you see here it is basically an excerpt of the final MITQC report. On top, you can see the graph statistics. Then there's a 2D visualization here followed by a 1D visualization, which uh, I will explain uh, in a moment. And so what was really puzzling in the beginning when you took, take a look at the statistics is that we have actually 3 billion Ns in this graph, but chromosome 19 is only 59 million base pairs, and that was really confusing. And so, um, I, I, um, yeah, I was calculating, I divided 3 billion by these 1,000 genomes, and then we end up at around 3 million, right? And the 1,000 Genomes Project is not the newest data, and so if you take a step back to um, HG19, it also has around 3 million Ns in it in chromosome 19, and so the numbers actually fit. And that's because in, during the punch genome graph construction uh, steps, we don't align the Ns, and so it, they just get added up, up, and up, and so that's why we have so many Ns in there. And that's what you can also observe in this 1D visualization, basically. <clears throat> so here, um, we arrange the nodes actually in 1D from left to right. And then we color the nodes by 
the path coverage. So if a huge amount of path actually support that node, so that certain sequence, then we color it in blue, and if uh, only there is a, no, a low number of paths that support that coverage, we color it in red. And so because we uh, accumulate in 1D all these nodes with Ns, then of course we all mostly see uh, this uh, red color here. And the interesting parts where actually some alignments happened are actually only here really tiny and here really tiny, yeah. And so basically maybe it's a better idea to remove the ends before you build such a punch genome graph. <clears throat> Next, I also built a punch genome graph from uh, around 2,000 E. coli sequences. And here, the quadratic all versus all line problem actually really becomes a huge problem, even with these parallelized steps. So WF mesh map was relatively quickly. However, WF mesh align took 1,000 times 20 minutes, and, and that's really quite a lot. And in the end, I got puff files of around uh, over 600 gigabytes on disk. And then Secret was really unhappy because it only had two terabytes of scratch space, and this was not sufficient to even start the index building. So I thought, okay, maybe I can revert to our large network storage, but it was so slow, it didn't complete it in a reasonable time at all. So uh, FMesh actually comes with a parameter where, where you actually can set the percentage of mappings that should be retained for more further downstream analyses. And so I used this, and so this allowed me actually then to get much like the alignment problem, WF mesh alignment problem actually became much smaller. And so this time it only required 100 times five minutes to do the base pair level alignments instead of 1000 times 20 minutes. Still Sequish was unhappy because it didn't have enough RAM. And so there's a parameter which allows you to just lower the number of bases which are processed in one batch it takes longer, but still you can run it. And so after that, it only took five hours for the sequence step and for the final smooth XG step, which normalizes the graph. Um, this took 62 hours and I was only able to do one round. Usually we do three rounds because it was just so much data. Here you can see the result. On top again, the statistics of the graph and the 1D visualization now on top with the 2D visualization on the bottom. So in this 1D visualization, I didn't explain yet, I just realized, these black things here, they actually are the edges of the graph. So they represent the topology, but in 1D it's actually super hard to understand what's going on. That's why we usually also have these 2D visualizations. So here we see that the huge part of the punch genome is actually covered by most of these sequences. However, some part of the punch genome is uh, unique to some of these uh, E. coli. And we know that E. coli have lots of bacteria sex and then genes get added, just genes get deleted and, or rearranged. And that's why this punch genome graph actually is so super complex here. And that's also why here in this 2D visualization, we have this large blob because basically if you have so many sequences, every sequence somehow interacts with another sequence, but at different places, and that's why it looks so complex, and that's uh, why Phil yesterday, I think, was so scared of this huge blob, because it's crazy, but that's just reflecting biology. What you see here, oh, sorry, where's the mouse? What you can see here on the left-hand side um, are some extra graph components, and apparently they were not similar enough to be put into this huge graph. Yeah, that was really quick, I think. Um, that's already everything I wanted to tell you, and I'm happy to take questions. Excellent. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, there, are, there are two questions in the Slack, but we're actually running a little short on time, if you don't mind answering sure. those in Slack. 